Last month, I put out a question to my Middle Eastern subscribers, asking them about their traditions and meals around Christmas time. I was planning a video to talk about Middle Eastern Christmas traditions and dinners, however, I ran into an issue because I don't have any footage of these traditions to show you. So instead of trying to explain Middle Eastern Christmas as an outsider, I thought it would be good to tell you what goes into putting together a Middle Eastern feast and what might be different for Christmas. Much the same as planning any menu, you can easily split a Middle Eastern feast into four parts. Appetizers, sides, mains and desserts. Middle Easterners love soup, and so usually every feast will begin with a soup appetizer. This could be lentil soup or harira, and the most common soup is literally broth with some orzo pasta. Personally, I'm not crazy about soups. I'd rather save my stomach space for other dishes, and I totally recommend this if you're making a wide variety. In terms of side dishes, most foods that you commonly think of as appetizers, such as salad, sambusak, or any sort of mezzan dishes, will usually be served as sides. You want to strike a balance between the flavours and varieties, so have at least one salad, then at least one vegetable and one meat-based side dish. Alongside those, you'll of course serve some carbs, and serving both pasta and rice dishes is extremely common. Vermicelli rice is probably the most versatile of the Middle Eastern rice recipes, and it's what you'd serve alongside most saucy dishes. Before a feast, you'd want to jazz things up, so serving hashwa rice with spiced meat or khalta rice with nuts and sultanas would be a great option. The mains is where you really get to play around. Every country will have their own favourite main dishes, such as Egyptian fatta, Jordanian mansaf, Armeni shoa, or even stuffed pumpkins. There are hundreds of mains you can serve, and these are usually big cuts of meat. In some countries like Egypt, it's tradition to serve at least one poultry main and one red meat main. The most popular option is a leg of lamb or a cut of beef, but also turkey and duck are quite popular. Finally, for desserts, you'd serve any number of treats, though it's considered polite for guests to bring dessert with them. This will probably be some form of baklava, but you could also serve kunefa or ma'ali or atoyif, or any of the desserts that I've done on this channel. Last but not least is drinks. During the meal, most people will drink fresh fruit juices or fizzy drinks, then with dessert, they'd serve some strong black tea. For a Christmas dinner, things might be a little different. Most Middle Eastern Christians will observe a period of fasting before Christmas, and for some groups, that means altering their diet to be vegan for extended periods. Christmas dinners then become the first non-vegan meal, and as such, they're filled with all sorts of meat dishes that were missed. These will heavily depend upon which country you're from, but expect that you'll get a mix of regular home cooking as well as some fancier things like turkey and leg of lamb. There's a ton of different dishes that can be made, so I'd recommend you go through the community posts on the channel and read through all the fantastic answers. For our menu, we decided to keep it simple. We skipped the soup entirely, and for side dishes, we made a Lebanese fattoush salad and a Palestinian cauliflower and tahini bake. The main dishes are an Iraqi uzi leg of lamb with uzi rice and an Egyptian frika stuffed chicken. Then for dessert, we had some pistachio baklava, as well as date mamoul, which is traditional for Christmas. With a little planning, you can have all of this on the table with just a couple of hours of work on the day of the feast. To make the fattoush salad, I used the same recipe from my fattoush video. I chopped the veggies, made the dressing, and fried the pita in the morning. Then I just threw them together right before serving. I'd highly recommend doing this if you're making loads of dishes, because it will literally take you 30 seconds to put together, and it's ready for the table. The cauliflower and tahini bake was also quite easy. You could make most of it the night before, then assemble it and place it straight into the oven. It has become one of my favourite discoveries of 2021, and we've had it 4 times in 10 days. To make it, get a 750 gram cauliflower, peel off the leaves, then slice it into individual florets. Cut any larger ones into bite sized pieces, then place a frying pan on your stove over high heat, and add in about 1cm of frying oil. When that's heated, you can add in the cauliflower in batches, and you'll fry it until it turns golden. A word of warning, cauliflower contains a lot of water, and this will spit boiling oil at you, so I'd highly recommend you get a splatter screen to prevent nasty burns. When the cauliflower is golden on one side, flip it and fry the other side. I prepared an oven tray with some kitchen roll, and when the cauliflower was golden like this, I took the pieces out and allowed them to drain. While they're still hot, you should sprinkle them with some salt, and then these can stay refrigerated until you need them. You also need to saute some onions for this dish. So add 2 tablespoons of olive oil to a pot over medium heat, then add 2 to 3 onions chopped to a medium dice. Saute these for about 5 to 7 minutes, stirring the pot regularly, then when they just start browning on the edges, they can be removed. Both the cauliflower and onion can be made ahead of time and stored in the fridge for a couple of days. To assemble, you'll need a small baking dish like this one, and to it you'll add your cauliflower in an even layer. When that's filled, add all of your sautéed onions onto the cauliflower, making sure to spread them out evenly. Now you'll pour over a tahini sauce, and this one is quite easy to make, but I don't think you can make it ahead of time. In a jug or bowl, add 120 grams of tahini paste, a video over here if you want to make it yourself. 
add three cloves of minced garlic, then half a teaspoon each of salt, pepper and cayenne. Add a quarter teaspoon of cumin, then pour in 60 milliliters or a quarter cup of lemon juice. Finally, add 350 milliliters or one and a half cups of water and blend the whole thing together. You need to make sure that this is properly emulsified into a loose sauce because if it isn't well mixed then the mixture can't split. Now pour the entire mixture evenly over the cauliflower and it's ready to go into the oven. Bake this at 180 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes or until the liquid has reduced and the top has browned like this. Let it cool a little, then garnish it with some parsley and you'd be surprised by the insane amount of flavour that this bite packs in. For the main dishes, we had to make this frika stuffed chicken, and this is a classic Egyptian dish that's served at Egyptian feasts and Christmas. Theoretically, you could probably do a turkey this way, but two chickens would cook better and be a lot easier. If you didn't know, frika is durum wheat, but when it's still in the field and the grain is yet to dry, the wheat is set on fire and allowed to burn. This speeds up the harvest process and it gives the grain a delicious smoky flavour. Just like oats and other whole grains, this does take some time to cook, but it has a great texture and it's supposed to be really healthy. Of course, we'll make it less healthy by stuffing it in a chicken, but before we do that, we have to marinate our bird. This was a one kilogram chicken, and I cleaned it up by using some kitchen roll to remove any organy bits that were left in the cavity. The inside of my chicken wasn't looking super clean, and because we're going to stuff this, you don't want any blood left behind. I gave mine a gentle rinse and clean the sink and when I was done it was looking pretty clean. Now your job is to separate the chicken skin from the meat, so using your fingers work your way around each of the breasts then repeat it and do the same thing on the chicken thighs. Separating the skin will allow it to get really crispy in the oven and we'll also be placing marinade under the skin for extra flavouring. You can make this marinade by blending together two medium onions with half a teaspoon each of black pepper and ground cardamom. Add two teaspoons of salt, then blend this until the onion has been roughly chopped and you have a marinade that looks like this. Take a handful of the marinade, then press it into the cavity of the chicken, making sure you spread it around all the sides. You'll take another handful and place it between the breast and the chicken skin, then repeat that with the other breast and the chicken legs. One thing to note, you'll have to remove this marinade later, so if you're having a hard time getting it in, you'll probably struggle to get it out as well. Finally, when you're done stuffing the marinade, you can take any leftovers and spread them all over the outside. This chicken needs to marinate for at least two hours, but I'd recommend six to eight for full flavor penetration and crazy juicy chicken. To make the frika, you'll first need to soak the grain for about two hours. Add a cup of frika to a bowl, then pour in loads of water and give it a mix. The water can get a little dirty, so you should wash this a few times until the water remains clear. When the grains have finished soaking, they'll have doubled in size like this, and then they're ready to cook. Add two tablespoons of olive oil to a pot over medium heat, then add a bay leaf and allow it to infuse. Once the oil has heated, add two onions chopped to a small dice, then saute for four to five minutes until the onions have softened. Now add in one and a half teaspoons of salt, one teaspoon of black pepper, three quarters of a teaspoon of baharat or seven spice, and a quarter each of cardamom and cinnamon. Mix these with the onions, then add the frika and give it another mix to combine. At this point, add in one and a half cups of water to the pot and it should just barely cover the grains. Cover the pot with a lid and keep the heat on medium and it should come to a light boil. Now turn the heat down to low and replace the lid, then let this cook for 45 minutes to an hour. You'll know it's done when the grains have cooked through and they have a soft and fluffy texture. At this point, add in three teaspoons of sumac, then mix it until well combined. Now take out a few spoonfuls of the frika to stuff the chicken and spread it out over a plate to cool. The rest of the frika should be left in the pot and you should let this cook for another 15 minutes before turning off the heat and steaming it for 20 minutes with the lid on. Once your frika has cooled, you can stuff the chicken, but first you need to remove the marinade. Go between the skin and pull out as much of the marinade as you can from between the meat and the skin. You also want to remove most of the marinade from the cavity. Then when it's cleaned up like this, it's ready to stuff. Transfer the chicken to a baking tray, then add the frika to the cavity, making sure it's just loosely placed in there and not packed in. Now you'll take the flaps of skin to either side of the cavity and you'll fold them over each other to completely cover the opening. You should now use a toothpick like a sewing needle and sew together both sides of the skin so that the frika is sealed into the chicken. Alternate piercing each side of the skin with a toothpick and you'll end up sewing it together like this. Tie the legs together using some butcher's twine and then you'll have a perfectly stuffed chicken ready to be roasted. The last thing you'll do is pour over some olive oil and then massage it into the skin which will give us a beautiful golden colour. 
This should bake in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius for one to one and a quarter hours. However, it will depend upon the size of your chicken. When it's looking good, check the center of the stuffing for temperature, as well as the breasts and the thighs, and they should all read at least 74 degrees Celsius. If your chicken is cooked, but the stuffing isn't, cover it with some foil and allow it to cook a little longer. As you can see, my chicken was absolutely beautiful, and I'm honestly surprised by how well this turned out without a rotisserie. You should plate this up by filling a serving platter with the steamed trika, then place your chicken on top and garnish it with some fried almonds. Finally, you can top it with some chopped parsley, and I think that this is one of the most seductive things that I've ever cooked. When sliced into, the chicken is extremely juicy, and as someone who loves roast chicken, this was absolutely spectacular. Of course, with an amazing chicken main, we had to make an equally amazing lamb one, and that's why we chose to do Iraqi Uzi. Uzi is a roast cut of lamb served with a lamb stock infused rice, and Salma found a million different recipes for this dish. The ones we were most curious about involved brushing a tomato and saffron mixture onto a leg of lamb before slow roasting for 6 hours. To do this, we're using our favourite slow roasting technique, which involves wrapping the meat in greaseproof paper to seal in all the flavour and keep the meat extremely moist. First, take a deep oven dish and then cut two sheets of greaseproof paper about three times the length of the tray. Roll the sheets up into balls, then soak them in water for about 10 seconds. This will make the paper extremely pliable and will allow them to fold like cloth. Lay them into the tray with one perpendicular and one horizontal, then set the tray aside so we can make a bed of aromatics. Take two heads of garlic and slice them in half, then take two to three onions and slice them into strips about this big. Place the onions and garlic into your prepared tray and then you'll add some whole spices. You'll need about six bay leaves, four to five cloves and one teaspoon of black peppercorns. And we unfortunately forgot to add about eight cardamom pods. Now you'll take a lamb shoulder or leg or whatever cut you can get your hands on and this is about one and a half kilogram with the bone in. Place this on the bed of aromatics then you'll add on the oozy rub. To make this, take a pinch of saffron, this was about 20 to 30 threads and add it to a mortar with a pinch of salt. You could also replace this with half a teaspoon of ground turmeric if you find saffron hard to come by. Grind the saffron into the salt until it has turned into a powder, then pour in some hot water and dissolve all of the saffron so that you're left with a golden liquid like this. Add in 30 grams of tomato paste and 2 teaspoons of salt, as well as 1 teaspoon of black pepper and half a teaspoon of paprika. Mix this all together into a thick paste, then add a few spoonfuls of it to the underside of your lamb. Spread this out really well, making sure you cover the whole underside, then flip it over and repeat on the top side. When done, the lamb should be well coated in the mixture, and this will give the lamb a ton of flavour. Before you seal this, pour in about half a cup of water, and now you can fold over the paper. Fold each side all the way over the lamb, then tuck it in and repeat folding the next side over. This will help to trap in any steam and all the flavours, and you should be left with something that looks like this. Now place this into your oven to bake at 150 degrees Celsius for about 6 hours. About 20 minutes from the end, you'll remove the excess paper and let this broil so that the top can brown. When it comes out of the oven, it will have this amazing grilled appearance. The meat should be extremely tender and the tray will be filled with loads of lamb juices. You'll need this for the Uzi rice, so pour the liquid through a strainer and set it aside to cool. Making the rice is really easy. Just add 3 tablespoons of oil to a pot over medium heat, then add in 3 cups of rice which should be washed until the water runs clear. Fry the rice in the oil for about 1 minute, then add 1 teaspoon of salt and pour in the lamb stock. The liquid should cover the rice by about 1cm, and if not, top it up with some water. Let this come to a boil, then cover the pot with a lid and let it boil on high for about 3 minutes. When the time is up, the liquid should have dropped below the rice. Turn the heat down to low and let this steam with the lid on for about 20 minutes. The rice should be fully cooked and you can fluff it up with a fork and let it steam for a couple minutes further. At the end you'll have these wonderful grains of rice which are all separated and they'll taste of the lamb stock that they were cooked with. With the rice done you'll need to cook some vermicelli and it's a wheat pasta that we serve with rice in the Middle East. In a pot add a quarter cup of vegetable oil and heat on medium heat. Once the oil is hot add in 250 grams of wheat vermicelli and mix it with the oil. This needs to fry for about 5-6 to six minutes and during that you'll constantly need to stir the pot. Rather than mixing, you'll need to use a folding motion to ensure that all the vermicelli evenly browns. It will take some time, but eventually it will reach this brown fried colour, and at this point you can add half a teaspoon of salt and pour in some water. Add enough to pretty much cover the vermicelli, bring it to a boil, then turn the heat down to medium and let it cook with the lid on for about 10 minutes. When the time is up, the vermicelli should have cooked through like so. This can be fluffed up with a fork and left to steam for a couple minutes more. 
When done, it will look like this, and it's one of my favourite alternatives to rice. Finally, we can serve the uzi, and to do this, get a large plate and add on a bed of the uzi rice. Spread this out well, then add on a layer of the fried vermicelli, and any extras can be served on the side. Now you'll top this with some fried almonds, and these are blanched almonds which I fried in some vegetable oil until they turned golden. Add as much of these as you like, then add on some rehydrated sultanas and raisins. These can be prepared by soaking raisins or sultanas in water for about half an hour until they're nice and plump. I added the lamb shoulder on top of the rice, then I went back and added more almonds and raisins before giving it a final garnish of parsley. If you need to know one thing about me, it's that lamb shoulder is my favourite food in the world, and this recipe was up there with the best. We've done a few lamb shoulders on the channel before, and you could easily serve any of them at a Middle Eastern feast. This time we made a second lamb shoulder with a 24 hour onion marinade, and we cooked it for 6 hours till it was almost falling off the bone. If you haven't had slow cooked lamb shoulder before, it is possibly the greatest meat in existence, and you can see just how juicy it is. With the rest of the dishes, it makes up a small yet fantastic Middle Eastern feast, and it's certain to impress your friends or family. Making a meal like this can be a lot of work, but it's a labour of love, and every person who sits at your table will appreciate it. Selma and I have served many a feast in our time, and it's a tradition we got from our mothers and grandparents. Whatever you choose to serve this holiday season, consider adding a Middle Eastern dish to the table, and we hope you have a great holiday. Now click here if you want to see more Middle Eastern feast recipes.